They call it a celebration of science. Marches are being held around the world calling on governments to respect and encourage science-based policies. But can people power change what some are calling the anti-science agenda? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. Scientists and climate activists say they are under attack. They've persuaded nearly 200 countries of the need to fight global warming with the signing of the Paris Agreement. Well, now President Donald Trump is threatening to pull the United States out of that deal, saying he's not convinced the scientists got it right. Climate activists oppose the Trump administration are bringing their message to the streets of Washington with two big marches planned for this month. They call it March for Science. Already thousands have demonstrated in Australia. In Sydney, the rallying call was the demand to maintain public investment in science. In Taiwan, hundreds of volunteers marked World Earth Day by cleaning the main river in Taipei. Men and women of all ages took part. And the Paris Agreement on Climate Change came into effect in the Philippines on Saturday. Hundreds gathered to oppose environmentally damaging practices. Jamila Lindigan has more from Manila. Students from different universities, members of different organizations have all gathered here to send a very strong message to the government. They say that in order for the president to secure the future of this country, it has to look back at the protection and make the protection of environment, in fact, a priority. There are many issues facing the environment today. What they want is security for the farmers, a comprehensive agrarian land reform program, the protection of indigenous tribes, particularly in areas where they caught up in armed conflict and of course the protection of the environment from abusive mining practices all across the country. There's an underdevelopment of uh, science and technology in the Philippines. We have no national industry. That's why most of our scientists are underemployed or find jobs abroad. We're pushing for national industrialization so it can provide a science and technology that can um, actually uh, provide potential jobs and opportunities for our young students and young scientists in the Philippines. There is no shortage of pro-environment policies. In fact, the government even signed the climate change peace pact but what activists here say what they want to see is for the government to actually invest in the industry itself invest in education invest in research and make sure that those industries in fact get the support that they need especially for millions of Filipinos who are now facing the brunt of extreme weather conditions the Philippines is a country most vulnerable to natural disasters well, U.S. President Donald Trump has called climate change a hoax. Last month, he signed an executive order lifting restrictions on the use of coal after promising in the campaign to bring back coal mining jobs. Today, I'm taking bold action to follow through on that promise. My administration is putting an end to the war on coal. Going to have clean coal, really clean coal. With today's executive action, I am taking historic steps to lift the restrictions on American energy, to reverse government intrusion, and to cancel job-killing regulations. Let's bring in our guests now for today's Inside Story. In Berlin, we have Manuel Pulgar Vidal. He's head of climate and energy at the World Wildlife Fund from Stanford in the U.S. state of California. We're joined by Skype uh, by Gastriela Chichilensky, a climate change economist. And from Washington, D.C., Dan Kaninen, former White House liaison at the Environmental Protection Agency under the Obama administration. Good to have you all on Inside Story. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, Manuel, in Berlin, if I can start with with you why is a march for science needed in 2017 what is this going to achieve i think that in this day in which we are celebrating the earth day which motto it is environmental and climate literacy what we do need it is a very strong science and scientific message not only to the people but also to the politician because science has already has already uh, uh, said to us that we should raise ambitions as a way to deal with the objective of not overpass the one 
1.5 degrees threshold. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows, and I've already heard about what is happening in Philippines, but some days ago also in South America, in Peru, Ecuador, in Colombia, because of El Nino, that we need to act quickly if we want to stop the damage that climate right. change is creating to us. But so Manuel, that is why science, it is a key element. Manuel, uh, there have been various forms of climate change denial over the years in the US, in Australia and elsewhere. This is nothing new. Why is it more worrying today that we're hearing these climate change deniers and that their voice is getting louder, it seems? Look, uh, I've been in the environmental sector for almost 30 years. I went to Rio 92 in a time in which also there were deniers. Uh, uh, after that, also in Kyoto, in Copenhagen in 2009. So we are in a world in which we are going to fight against deniers. But what we do need it is to show that climate change, it is currently creating damage. It is really making people more poor. It is destroying infrastructure. It is facing us with new challenges. But on the other hand, if this is the hand or the position of the optimism. Fortunately, the countries and the world has already shown political will, but not only the state actors, but the non-state actors. And in that sense, the business sector, the academia, the indigenous people, the civil society organization are pushing this process toward fulfill with our objective that we got in Paris two years ago. Okay. So we are going to continue having deniers, but I'm completely optimistic that we can deal with our objectives. Okay, Graciela in uh, Stanford. I mean, there are those who say a march by scientists, while well-intentioned, only serves to trivialize and politicize science, and that this march basically is not going to do any good in bringing attention to the issue of, of climate change. Would you agree with that? No, I don't. I think the march is very important because it shows that science is not just for the few. It's a basic need for the people of the world. And in this case, climate change is an issue of survival for the human beings as a whole. So this march is a march for human survival. Dan, in Washington, D.C., Manuel uh, talked about the political will there uh, a short while ago. It seems that in Washington, that political will isn't there anymore. How exactly uh, does the Trump administration's policy sideline science's role in, in public policy and the science on climate change? Because it seems that the, the political will isn't there anymore. Not only is the political will not there, there is a willful disregard of science and facts. It's one thing to ignore and stick your head in the sand for purely economic reasons or, or to make a political point, but this administration has worn ignorance of science as a badge of honor in many cases. I think that's very dangerous. Uh, and, and to your point about climate denial, yes, it's occurred uh, for years and decades, and we fought it here in the U.S. Uh, every political cycle and in between. Mm -hmm. What is different about this moment is that beyond just denying the fact that climate change is occurring based on man-made practices, the EPA administrator, Scott Pruitt, denied that carbon was even a pollutant. This is very much akin to cancer, uh, excuse me, cigarette manufacturers arguing that it doesn't cause cancer. Uh, it's really going backwards, and I think it's a dangerous moment for our, our world politically and, and in terms of uh, climate change. Now, the Trump administration, I read, is threatening to cut large areas of uh, science research, Dan. He's talking about cutting funding for basing, uh, basic government research into cancer, climate change as well, uh, forensics and other areas. What impact is this going to have? I, I know you're very concerned about this, but what impact concretely is it going to have? It's going to have a tremendous impact on every aspect of our ability to protect public health, human health, and the environment. Uh, you know, Donald Trump made a big show in the campaign of going to Flint, Michigan, where a water crisis uh, injected lead poisoning into that water supply and forced residents there to drink bottled water for weeks and months, and in some cases they still are. Uh, yet now in his administration, cutting basic research, cutting basic enforcement, cutting any clean water grants, cutting the clean air program, uh, this will have a tremendous impact not only on clean air and clean water, but on economic development as well. Uh, manufacturers of, 
of chemicals that we use in everyday products need to have the public trust that the water is safe to drink, that products are safe to use for their kids. And I think that will have a detrimental impact not only to the environment and to uh, human health, but also to our economic interests. Uh, Graciela in uh, Stanford, if you can just explain to our international viewers what the uh, reasoning is here from, from the Trump administration. How do they explain these cuts? And is the message uh, that they're uh, driving right now, is that being heard on, uh, the lo at the local level? Are people hearing this message? Well, as far as I can understand, it, there is a lack of message. Mm. It's almost like lack of knowledge or regressing to the past. It's uh, outdated information, very seriously outdated information that appears to be percolating in within the administration. It's almost like they are missing the information that the science has provided and that we know and what's really happening. 40% of the children in New York City, for example, have asthma and coal affects more than anything uh, locally the children and yet uh, the Trump administration and Trump himself mm. describe coal as clean. So it looks like um, there is a cognitive disconnect. It's almost like the information is missing there. They may be back 50 years in time. Right. Manuel, in Berlin, it seems so that it's not just the U.S. officials who are alone in being climate change deniers. It's not just in the U.S. where we're hearing this you know, growing voices, voice getting louder. Uh, how do we make people better understand the role of science in uh, illuminating the threat of global warming? And how do we respond basically to these uh, climate change deniers, not just in the U.S., but in several other countries as we've seen in the last few months? Ah, so, uh, three ideas. The first one, it is that the science has already told to us that we are raising the temperature in a way that we can create catastrophic effects. And everybody knows and there are evidence that that is happening now. Secondly, the world is facing regularly natural disaster in the Philippines, in South America, among some other places in the country. But the third, that for me it is the most important in this time, it is that by working in climate change and by facing the consequences, we are working for the people. We are working for their jobs and their security. Let me put an example. Currently in the U.S., there are more people being employed because of renewable energies than in coal. And has just fit in the renewable in relation to fossil fuels industry. So by working in climate change, also we are working for the people. And that is a very important message because it is the only way in which we can continue engaging the citizens to be part of this process. And let me say one last thing in relation to with what Dan has just raised. Mm -hmm. I'm more optimistic. Remember that some years ago in Kyoto, the United States didn't be part of the Kyoto Protocol. Even, do, even though that, we ha we've been able to move the process toward the Paris Agreement. And I am completely sure that we should continue, or no, we could continue moving the process toward the future, toward the 2050 neutral carbon economy. So in, in, in this pathway, sure, we are going to have some kinds of difficulties, political accidents, but I'm completely optimistic that by bringing all the pieces and by bringing all the actors together, we can deal with the objective. You talk about the Paris Agreement, Manuel. Well, let's just give our viewers uh, a bit more information about it. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, also known as the Paris Agreement, came into force on the 4th of November 2016. 195 countries signed the deal, 143 of which have ratified it. The Philippines is the latest to do so, as we mentioned. So what exactly is in this agreement? Well, the treaty commits world leaders to keeping global temperatures below 2 degrees Celsius, a number seen as a threshold for safety by scientists. To achieve that, countries had to put forward pledges to cut greenhouse gas emissions. The agreement also has a long-term goal for net zero emissions, which would effectively phase out fossil fuels. And it entitles developing countries to assistance from developed countries through finance, technology, and capacity building. Dan, in Washington, D.C., when the Trump administration threatens to pull the U.S. out of this accord, are they really serious about it? 
It's very hard to say how serious this administration is about anything. They have consistently made promises and proclamations about actions that then do not happen or follow through. So I'm not sure about that. However, I think it is not in our interests uh, to pull out of Paris. I think that uh, there are massive threats to our, our, our international interests, to our business interests. There's a potential of a reprisal on trade uh, in the form of a carbon tax from countries like Mexico or Canada. No one wins in a trade war, and I think that ultimately economic voices here domestically will convince Mr. Trump to perhaps stay in. I do worry about what happens domestically in terms of our own program to cap carbon. Uh, but I agree with Manuel. I think there is reason to be optimistic that even if we pull out of Paris or if we stay in with a reduced commitment on the domestic side, the train has left the station, so to speak, on clean energy technology. Mm -hmm. uh, places like China are investing dramatically uh, in clean energy technology. I think the risk to the U.S. is our global position and our ability to lead, our ability to create jobs here at home, uh, and our ability to drive innovation in a way that pro projects uh, that global leadership. That's our risk. But I do think, despite this precarious moment, there is reason to believe that uh, this commitment is binding, it is strong, and we will continue to move forward to address this critical challenge. Uh Graciela, do you agree with that? Dan says the uh, Paris Agreement commitment is binding, it's strong. Do you, do you see it that way? Did it go far enough in your view? And what would the U.S. pulling out of this agreement mean? No, I don't see it that way. Uh, the Paris Agreement, and I was there and I worked on it, uh, <clears throat> was an expression of agreement by 195 nations about how important it is to remain below two degree centigrade in terms of increases in the mean temperature. And in that sense, it succeeded. But it has no mandatory elements, as the Kyoto Protocol did. No mandatory elements means that no country is obliged or has obliged itself to do anything in terms of restricting emissions. Uh -huh. So it's really more of a consensus and doc document the Paris Agreement and a document of hope, which is important. However, something that has just been said and is being missed is that the technology now exists for removing carbon directly from the atmosphere and selling it so it can be used commercially while making profits, you can clean the atmosphere. How come nobody knows about it in the new administration? It's almost like there is a disconnect with reality, which was mentioned before by one of the speakers here. So in reality, I think there is reason to hope for a completely different uh, reason, if you wish, mm. that uh, there is technology. In fact, I am the CEO of a company that has been chosen as the second most innovative company in the area sure. of energy globally and global thermostat. And what it does, it removes CO2 from the atmosphere mm. and sells it for commercial use, cleaning the atmosphere okay. while creating economic development. So what are what is the dispute here? Why are we not advancing economic development mm. while cleaning the atmosphere? Let, what is stopping that? It appears to me Let's Ignorance. hear from Manuel. Let's hear from Manuel on this. Uh, Manuel Graciela says the Paris Agreement doesn't go far enough. What are your views on this? And also, what would the U.S. pulling out of this agreement mean for it? Would, would it collapse? Surely the agreement is bigger than the Trump administration, is it not? Yeah. Okay. Let, let me say that I don't agree with Graciela because to understand the Paris Agreement, we should have, have into consideration that before of that, we had suffered a failure during the Copenhagen process. So the Paris Agreement, it is good not only because it has identified a threshold, two clear objectives of decarbonization and resilience, a way to make it more enforceable through these pledges that are called the INDCs or the National Determined Contribution because of the means of implementation, but and that is the most important thing, because it has been the result of a bottom-up process. So it has been the result of a process that had created confidence in almost 200 countries to be part of the same process. Why Copenhagen failure before of the Paris Agreement? Because at that time, the world would suppose that we could impose an agreement, and we failed in 2009. But in 2015, 
the Paris Agreement was the result of that confidence that the NDCs and the former COPs in Warsaw and in Lima had created before, before of Paris. What can it mean, or what could it mean, if the United States fails out and, and go out of the Paris Agreement? I think that we are going to have difficulties. Right. That's true. But fortunately, still we have a lot of political will and support not only of developing countries, but also of emerging countries. So what China is doing, not only moving and raising their ambitions in relation to cut emission, what India is doing in relation to renewable, what the Arab countries, as for example the Emirates, has just approved their plan to raise their ambition in renewable energy, it is what will continue moving the agenda. But also, and let me uh, reaffirm this, the role of the non-state actors. Because fortunately, since Lima COP20 in December 2014, this is not just an issue of countries and government, but an issue of non-state actors. And the business sector can really push this agenda. And let me say one more thing, and the last in relation to your question. When Trump signed the last executive order, there were more than a thousand of representatives of the business sector against that decision. So even in the U.S., the business sector right. are fortunately aligning to fulfill with the Paris Agreement. Let's uh, hear from, from Dan. Uh, Dan, uh, Manuel says the business sector can push the agenda. Next weekend's climate march uh, is looking to directly pressure uh, policymakers to back away uh, from the Trump administration's energy proposals. Do you think they will succeed? Can the business community, as Manuel say, says, actually be uh, the ones that push this agenda? I think in terms of convincing the Trump administration to take action, they can succeed in, in some short-term limited ways. Uh, ExxonMobil, other large companies, Shell, BP, have signed onto letters urging him to stay in the Paris Agreement for all the reasons we've discussed previously. And I think that that may actually win the day in terms of that agreement. Uh, I think some of the business sector can also succeed in limiting the cuts to the EPA that impact their bottom line. I think that there are others who will push on, on uh, ensuring that we continue to make efforts to advance renewable energy economy. I, I think that is hard to predict mm. how that will play out. Um, this administration has shown a willful disregard for, for anything that actually resembles a rational argument. They're playing politics all of the time, and Mr. Trump made a bet that with Eastern uh, Ohio and Western Pennsylvania and West Virginia voters who are deep in coal country, that he would be on their side no matter what. I worry that that political bet will override the rational argument from the business community. Okay, Graciela, I'm going to give you the last word here. Uh, Manuel says this is not just about governments. Non-state actors also have a role to play. And the public, we have been told, you know, we always have a role. We also need to protect our environment, you know, if we choose to recycle, for instance, refuse plastic bags and so on. Does this ha have an effect, actually? Does it help in any way? Yes, people do have an effect. And just to give you a very concrete example, uh, the United Nations has found that the uh, production and uh, distribution of meat represents approximately 20 or more percent of all the emissions globally. If people individually uh, would decide to decrease their meat consumption, which after all is uh, the consumption of other animals, which is not necessary, not necessary for our survival or strictly necessary for our health either, then we can have a tremendous impact on the global emissions. So yes, Every individual has an impact. And these marches that you observe are demonstrating it. And there are policies that every individual can take on their own, okay. like stopping to eat meat right away. Okay. That would have a big impact and is known. Okay. The business community can have a big impact sure. because okay. by utilizing technology innovation that exists now, it can remove CO2 from the atmosphere clean the atmosphere while increasing exports, increasing jobs, and economic development. The business community here has a very important role to play 
the other people in this program have said so. I strongly support that. Okay. And I think we have to move forward with it. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. Manuel Paul Garvidal, Graciela Cicilinski, and Dan Cannon. And thank you for being on Inside Story. And thank you for watching. You can always watch this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can, of course, also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fully Batibo, and the whole team, thank you for watching. Bye for now.